It is my pleasure to uh, bring greetings and to welcome you all to the 31st Historic Calgary Week. My name is uh, Marie Forster and I would like uh, to thank you for coming to our program this afternoon, Mapping Calgary's uh, labor, labor History. I'm really pleased today to be able to introduce uh, our two speakers for Mapping Calgary's Labor History. But before I do, I just need to mention uh, where this all started. And it started with the Alberta Labor Institute a history institute, the Alberta Labor History Institute. And I know Karen's going to add the uh, email address for that uh, uh, website down in the chat later on. And I just cannot recommend enough. If you have any interest in any, any subject to do with labor in Alberta, it's just such a great site and they keep, keep on uh, upgrading and uh, adding more to it. And that brings me to the two great people we have after this afternoon who are now adding their chapter to the history of uh, labor in Alberta. And the first person I'd like to introduce, if I may, is Kirk Neargarth. And he teaches uh, Canadian history at the University of uh, Mount Royal here in Calgary. And his first book, uh, the Dignity of Every Human Being focused on the history of Canadian art and culture during the 1930s, mm -hmm. Depression and the Second World War. He, he has, you might recognize him, presented at uh, Historic Calgary Week before and in 2019, there he is, Kirk, on the subject of Calgary and the 1919 Labour Revolt. And Kirk says, uh, best wishes to everyone and glad to be back. And uh, I also like to introduce uh, Karen Mills, and she's an artist, you're going to love it, writer and researcher based in Calgary. And she is a graduate of the uh, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Uh, and uh, also, and with Andy University in Halifax, as well as the Nova Scotia Community College. And she collaborates with the Alberta Labor History Institute. Again, you'll see some of her things on the site. And the Graphic uh, History Collective and the Harbinger Media Network, uh, a community of progressive uh, podcasts across Canada. Uh, and so here they are today already uh, and thank you so much uh, for uh, doing this presentation for us Karen and Kirk. Well thank you for the very generous introduction and Karen I think you're going to share your screen so we can start looking at the at the exciting images and we really okay. need to thank the um, Calgary Institute for the Humanities that is behind the Calgary Atlas project that uh, that um, that is the reason that this map exists. Uh, Karen, did you have anything else to add before we? Um, no, I, I think Marie and, and yourself have covered it pretty well. We're just gonna take everyone through our first couple of slides that gives an overview of the project, so. When, uh, when we were commissioned a couple of years ago now to produce a, a map of Calgary's labor history, uh, one of the daunting things was about how much we could possibly include. So we thought of various themes, but what we ultimately decided on was to try and include a range of things. And, uh, and, and it was tough to decide what goes in and what goes out, but I think that uh, we wanted to tell stories from the earliest days of Calgary, including uh, Calgary's first union, which was the Knights of Labor. It started meetings, you can see it in the Herald in 1886, in, uh, what was a Masonic Hall in, in Calgary, not the one that is still uh, existent today. Uh, and then we wanted to cover kind of the high point of success in labor politics in Calgary in the early 20th centuries when they routinely won municipal elections and seats in provincial parliament and federal parliament, uh, a variety of labor candidates and uh, uh, 
representing different labor parties as well. And then we needed to cover the 1930s and the big protests that happened here. But as well, we wanted to cover, you know, as near as we could up to the present day, including the post-war period. And, uh, and we wanted to show the range of work. So yes, I mean, we've got a lot of strikes, but this isn't the only thing that happens uh, in labor history uh, and the range of workers. So uh, we wanted to include organizations like unions and political parties that were formed to act in the interests of workers, but also some significant people who took positions of leadership, as well as the ordinary rank and file men and women who participated in the events and built the spa spaces in which these events uh, took place. So Karen, I guess we'll go on to see what uh, on the map. So yeah, this is for sure. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna we're gonna show you. Um, you can see in the introduction slide here are the front and back covers. So this project is going to be a printed folded map, and we're nearing production on this so that it will soon be available in Calgary bookshops, and there'll be some uh, more. Um, I guess, announcements and publicity for it. But um, when you pick it up, it'll be yay big and you can uh, open it up. So we're going to go on to the next couple slides to show you what it would look like when you open it. So this is uh, the text side. Uh, so you can see the front and back covers. They're part of uh, that side when you unfold it, uh, but also has all the descriptions of the sites. So we have 40 sites and there'll be a list uh, of the sites um, in a couple more slides so that you can see the details. But here we just wanted to give you a general look of, uh, again, what the print version will look like. And these are all the sites. Uh, there's uh, about um, 100 to 200 word descriptions for each one. Just um, we tried to bring out something interesting about all of these, uh, want to include the date, any significant people involved in it. Um, actually, we did have some discussions about uh, saying whether people are significant or leaders or heroes or something, because I think we've all found in the last uh, couple of years, those words are, it's difficult to say, you know, what where the place of ordinary people is. So what we came up with is notable figures, because certainly, these people are notable, so you can't argue with that. Um, yeah, so I think we're good to move on to the other side of the map, unless you want to add anything, Kirk? No, carry on. All right, so this is the other side. So again, I have to disclaim that this is uh, into, into production and we may be still adjusting kind of the sizes and colors and things of these elements. So uh, but the drawings are here and they all represent 40 sites. Uh, so we had, um, again, kind of back and forth discussions of how to represent all these, like we didn't want to just have 40 buildings, because that's not that visually interesting. But we did want to include some of the uh, more recognizable or interesting ones. So we've got ones from the early 20th century up until the 80s and 90s, uh, contemporary buildings that you can still see others have been replaced or torn down. Um, but the other categories are quite interesting too, because we wanted to include um, symbols, objects, uh, we have a bus, we have a plane, <laughs> we have lots of groups of people, which I think is the most important. So uh, you can see for all, all their little figures and, and heads, even if it's just a circle, that's someone participating in these events as they happened. And I'll note that most of the um, figures in particular are drawn from historical photographs and archive photos, mostly from the Glenbow Museum, but other sources as well, like the Calgary Herald. Uh, some are from Google Maps and real life uh, observation of things that are still around, like the Legion. Um, and then others are just uh, symbols um, that we want to include, just to kind of give you the feel of, of labor and what the visual material people are interacting with through history. Because this is a map, space was particularly important, but it's a historic map. So uh, it's the way that space intersects with time. So the Palliser Hotel, for example, uh, is, is a space that's not considered generally a, a working class space, although it is a workplace for hundreds of people uh, and thousands probably over the years. But 
it's also the place where the Calgary branch of the Communist Party had its founding inaugural meeting. And so then this, uh, you know, gave us a, a kind of reason to include it on our map and also maybe a, a different way of viewing some of the spaces in Calgary. Uh, Mawada Stadium, which is now a uh, skateboard park, you know, it wasn't always a, a site of working class protest, but in the 70s, there were big demonstrations there to protest wage and price controls. And I think, is it the next slide we'll see the list of all the? Uh, yeah, we can uh, discuss um, as we see the list, uh, kind of Kirk mentioned kind of our whittling down process for uh, what, what to include. And obviously there's much more that can be included, but we, we did want to have some focus and structure um, to, to contain it. So we're just gonna take a look at this. So again, you can see the, the five categories, 40 sites, and then there's eight sites in each. And um, when you get into reading the descriptions, I mean, clearly there's some notable figures who are mentioned in uh, the other sites and there's buildings mentioned in people's biographies. So uh, it's just a way to organize and uh, focus in on these things, so. And I think with the, you know, with the exception of the uh, of the labor temple, which has a plaque on it, um, when you when you visit a lot of these sites, I mean, some of them were ephemeral; they're events, but others, you know, there's no indication uh, of the significance of many of these places to uh, to Calgary's labor history. So this map, although you know, as you could see from the previous image, you maybe wouldn't navigate it with it, but it would uh, allow you to to go to some of these spaces where some of these significant events, and we'll talk about a few of them, uh, transpired. Yeah, for sure. So uh, the project that this is all part of, the Calgary Atlas project, is primarily uh, representing spaces through art symbols. Uh, but for our map, we did want to keep it pretty accessible. So in, in the previous slide, you can see uh, Meadowa Stadium is on like, the right side of Calgary or the correct side of Calgary. And then, you know, there's about half a dozen things that happened in City Hall. So we can't all put them in one little space, but they're kind of generally grouped around uh, where they happened. So, um, but we do recommend, uh, we think we can put a link in, in the chat here that there is a companion Google map if you want to um, use that to actually find these places. And there's also on the back side of the map is uh, the tech side does have the addresses that uh, we've tested and you can plug those in Google and say like, oh, I want to visit the Labor Temple today or I want to see where Pageant Hall was and what's there now sort of thing. So that would help you out. And uh, the other thing we wanted to mention, I just briefly uh, discussed that this is part of um, the Calgary Atlas project. So this is, uh, I think the fourth map or uh, one of one of the upcoming maps in this uh, pretty diverse and um, you know like ambitious project. So ones that uh, have been printed and are available so far include the queer map and the indigenous stampede map. So being conscientious of that, we also knew that we could um, give those maps kind of their space and do, and we we didn't necessarily have to. We do have uh, perspectives on, say, Indigenous fur trade workers, but uh, for for uh, you know entirely Indigenous perspective, there is an existing map as part of this project. So we didn't want to overlap or repeat information that is available, while we still wanted to represent uh, kind of the diversity and variety of the working class uh, history and um, labor history in Calgary. So shall we talk about the labor temple? Might as well. All right. So uh, among the uh, the, uh, the places that we, you know, didn't have enough tech space to do full justice to, uh, this is one of them because so many important events in Calgary labor history happened at the labor temple. So what we actually, you know, the in the 75 words that we had to write, we said, uh, in 1912, tradesmen gave their time to construct the building that became home to the Calgary Trade and Labor Council for over 60 years. This was the site of meetings of local, provincial, regional, and national significance, including the 1919 Western Labor Conference that created the One Big Union and the meetings that led to the founding of the CCF in 1932. 
And so those meetings were certainly significant. And, and we've got a little image of the Winnipeg general strike that this Western labor conference that happens in, uh, in March of 1919 really was a precursor to the Winnipeg general strike and to the Calgary uh, sympathy strike that happened as well. But really it's on the local level that the labor temple for decades was important to uh, organizations in the city, but, but not just for, you know, formal union meetings. There were all kinds of different events that we read about uh, following through the press, different speakers, dances, uh, lectures, guest speakers that would come through. Uh, so it was certainly uh, an important site for many of, uh, of Calgary's working people over the years. And now it, the building's still uh, extant and it's it's been redeveloped as, I'm not sure what it is actually, like a professional building of some kind. Yeah, I think offices and condos. Yeah, and then um, and then Karen has rendered that. Well, I don't know, Karen, do you wanna speak a little bit about the, the source for that image? Oh, sure, that's um, another archive photo. I think that is, from one of the meetings around 1919 or 20. So you can see the figures gathering in front. Um, I also included uh, in the slideshow um, a pretty recent photo. I don't know if the building looks exactly like that, but it, it does look like this after the renovation. You can see the front windows are a little bit different instead of the two windows on each side, top and bottom, you have uh, like a, a span of three windows, but I mean, Overall, it looks pretty similar and considering, you know, what, what we see pitched as redevelopment in Calgary, it's, it's uh, more or less intact and do, does respect the space. And I think Kurt mentioned that there is a plaque there, so. And one of the groups that frequently used uh, the Labour Temple for events was the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And uh, I think that's, on our next slide, and Karen did a really nice. Oh. <laughs> I kind oh, of uh, interspersed them, but <laughs> uh, sorry. I uh, uh, well, we yes, we could. We could do that. We, <laughs> this was a meeting that happened at the Labor Temple. Sorry, I've lost my spot on the script. No worries. Uh, yeah, so the the sleeping car porters will be the next subject that uh, Kirk addresses. So, uh, but um, the way that I've set up the uh, slides is that we need <laughs> to talk about the take turns discussing the individual uh, sites, but there is a through line to both of the, the sites that we're talking about. So, um, but I thought this was a nice uh, companion piece to the Labour Temple because this is another building that uh, would have pretty much very similar people, especially in the 1910s, 20s, 30s. Um, so, but of course the most famous uh, use of this building for uh, a labor history perspective is that this is of course the number one legion on 7th street and it uh, had the founding of the Canadian Commonwealth Federation so that's uh, or cooperative Commonwealth Federation uh, not not Canadian I think I everyone does that even if you've you've read extensively about it but uh, yeah so um, so as we put on the map um, on August 1st, uh, 1932, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, Farmer Labor Socialist, was established at a meeting of the Calgary Labor Temple. And then that evening, the first leader of the CCF, uh, J.S. Woodsworth, told a packed hall in the downtown Legion building that Canada had only two groups, the vested interests and the common people. When a system ceases to function for the people, it ceases to earn the loyalty of the people. That's what uh, Wordsworth said. So, of course, uh, I shouldn't see, of course, uh, folks might not know this. So, it's, um, the uh, CCF was the predecessor for our current uh, New Democratic Party in Canada, uh, which was formed in 1961 by merging the CCF and the Canadian Labour Con. Congress, the CLC. So there's still a focus on labor for the party and that party continues today in provincial and federal uh, jurisdictions. And uh, the last thing I would say about this site is I'm not the first person to draw the legion um, for the purposes of um, kind of labor history and education. Uh, there's a wonderful book by um, James Davidge and Nick Johnson and a few other artists uh, called First Legion of Utopia. You can see uh, 
the cover on there and that book is a graphic novel and it is available in the Calgary Library if you're wanting to check that out and just a great uh, great story, a uh, great uh, collection of images and history as well. So uh, at the CCF founding, they had meetings at both the Labour Temple and at, uh, at the Legion. I think the, the evening speeches were uh, at the Legion. And, the, uh, and so to return to the Labour Temple, when, when I was looking for trying to find where the business offices were of the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, um, when I found references to this organization in the press, it was usually at the Labour Temple. And this is actually where the group photo that you can see uh, on the upper right is taken. Um, for most of Calgary's first century, the railway was essential to its economy. And one group of railway workers that we wanted to represent were the sleeping car porters, many of whom were significant figures in Calgary's African Canadian community. In 1943, the 75 CPR sleeping car porters based in Calgary voted to join the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and just two years later, they won major concessions in an agreement of May of 1945. The unions and its, and its members, it's very clear from the press clippings about them were concerned about a lot more than just work and wages. Um, in July of 1945, they were instrumental in uh, founding the local branch of the Canadian League for the Advancement of Colored People. And then two years later, the president of the union the union local, uh, a P.T. Clay, was on the executive of a civic committee on racial tolerance, which was formed to protest in the, in the post-war period, the continuing uh, violation of the human rights of Japanese Canadians. And you can see uh, P.T. Clay in the top row of the far left of that group photo. And that's taken on the occasion of a, a, a visit to Calgary of the man who's front row center, who's Arthur Robertson Blanchett, um, who was uh, the kind of the Canadian head of this union, which was an international union. So trying to find where to place them on the map, um, I, I couldn't locate where Clay lived using city directories, um, but the, a number of the people who were listed as porters in the city directories around this period of the time of the union uh, founding, including uh, the secretary of, of the union, Ray Williams, who's in that group photo as well. He's in the front row on the left with the, the little girl on his lap. Um, and he's in the, the lower photo as well. So he lived in Victoria Park. And so uh, we generally sort of situated them uh, east-ish, although now that the map is quite stylized, it, it is a bit difficult to, to look, but that does seem to be uh, where, uh, where a number of them lived when, when the union was founded. Uh, and the photograph below that, you can see Williams again, he's on the far right, and the International Union President, uh, A. Philip Randolph, is presenting an award to Violet King. And this is in 1954. And this is on the occasion of her uh, graduating or passing the bar exam, becoming a lawyer. Um, she was the Calgarian who was the first black woman to become a lawyer in Canada, as many of you attending probably know. What you maybe don't know is that both her father and her brother worked as sleeping car uh, porters. And you can see how uh, Karen has, has rendered this sketch with some porters possibly um, between shifts or you know, waiting for the train to depart. Um, porter shifts, you know, they traveled uh, you know, right across the country on these, on these sleeper trains and their works were, were often days long on which they were on call uh, 24 hours a day. So uh, it, it's a group that you know, in the last couple of years there's been, been a number of books uh, published about uh, one quite recently called They Call Me George and then another earlier one which is actually a really good history by Sarah J. Mathieu called uh, North of the Color Line um, but, but the Calgary story I don't think has fully been told and so this is, this is a history awaiting its uh, uh, further explanation, exploration from a labor history perspective. No, for sure. So now we're on to Jean McWilliam. This is also another 
person from the early 20th century, kind of that, that period that we're exploring here. Um, so she's one of several women who are in the notable figures category. Uh, women have played and continue to take up uh, pivotal roles in unions and parties and confrontations like demonstrations and strikes in Calgary. So there was certainly no uh, issue of having to find women to include. They're, they're all over the place, which you absolutely love to see. Um, yeah, so we'll note that uh, Jean McWilliam, her dates are um, 1877 to 1969. She was co-founder of the Women's Labour League, a uh, champion of working women and social justice causes for decades. Her boarding house was a place where radicals visited the city and would also come for hospitality and lively conversation. Um, so this is a, a fun little set of facts that I found um, looking up more about her than, uh, than what we have on the map here. Um, so she came to Calgary in 1907 with her husband, William McWilliam. So that's, <laughs> that's fun. And two children. Uh, they separated in 1910. Um, she was able to open the boarding house and kind of provide uh, a like um, leader support role for many working people uh, during the next couple of decades. Um, but she... Uh, married another man in the 1930s who was also named William. So just really, really likes um, <laughs> the, the William name as that kind of follows her. Um, she's, uh, like I mentioned, she's best known for her activism in the 1910s and 20s. Um, she had a very direct confrontation style. Uh, she had a long time correspondence with Calgary lawyer and Prime Minister R.B. Bennett. You can see him there and um, also possibly a, a letter that they would have exchanged. And she also testified before the Royal Commission on Industrial Relations in 1919. So this is a quote that she had when she <clears throat> testified for them. Um, she was asked whether she favored a bloody revolution and considering the plight of working women in the city, she declared that any sort of revolution would be better than the conditions that they had now. So that would be the conditions of the time, which were not good for working people uh, post World War One. So. so we had to um, cover Calgary's Great Depression because the Calgary uh, unemployed were one of the most uh, active in kind of protesting their plight during the during the 1930s and there were in the early 30s uh, a series of relief strikes and major demonstrations uh, and then there were also some events of national significance like the on ottawa trek where the relief camp workers uh, from vancouver and british columbia traveled by a train and made stops along the way before they were stopped in regina at the regina uh, riot uh, and and certainly they got a very warm reception in, in Calgary. So I'll just tell you a couple of the, the stories that we decided to include from the, from the depression decade were, were this one that was local and then the on to Ottawa trek. Um, and, and if any of you can tell me uh, what, where exactly the Battle of Mission Hill uh, took place. I'd appreciate that because I've read the press coverage. I know where they, they marched, and, uh, but we, I'm not sure exactly what the relief project was. So here's the story. In uh, April of 1933, there were 1,500 men who were staging a, a relief strike. So this was basically men had to work for what we call welfare today, welfare payments. Uh, and they weren't satisfied with, with what they were receiving. They were holding out for better conditions. They wouldn't do these public work projects. They were holding a strike and they were having a parade down uh, McLeod Avenue. And when they heard that about 70 men had gone as strike breakers to the relief, uh, to the place where this public works was happening in Mission somewhere, um, about a thousand men from the parade went to try and convince them to stop breaking the strike. And there were a group of police who had cordoned off the area to try and protect the strike breakers. So Pat Lanahan, who was one of the leaders of the demonstration and also one of the leaders of the local communist party in Calgary, and then he becomes a city councillor in uh, 1937, 
before going on to have a long career involved in forming the, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, CUPE. Um, here's how he described the scene when these, these uh, men arrived at the uh, work site. The ex-servicemen, so these are veterans of the First World War, broke through the police lines. God, it reminded you of looking at a picture of Flanders or somewhere. They were going over the top. One policeman was struck through the helmet with a brick and there was a little blood. Then we formed and we marched through the city right down to the police station, the city hall. All the men were in the height of their glory. They were emancipated. But I said, today is our day. But I says, there'll be repercussions. Watch out. Lenahan was right. The mayor called for reinforcements from the RCMP and additional police came from Lethbridge, Edmonton, Regina. More than 30 arrests of those believed to be the ringleaders were made and ultimately 14 were convicted of unlawful assembly and sentenced to uh, a year in prison. So they actually, they sent, they divided their forces. They sent half of McLeod Trail and then the other half cut across, you know, I think it's 10th Avenue. Um, but, you know, where they actually, where this relief works were, were and all the coverage in the Herald, it just said they were on the, on the public work site. So what they were doing or building, I don't know. So if somebody knows, they could put it in the chat. In the On to Ottawa trek, I mean, it's, it's a fairly well-known story, but um, one Calgary connection, a woman I got to interview at the end, near the end of her life in the late 1990s, uh, when she was living in Kingston, Ontario, she had grown up in Calgary. Her father was in uh, the construction trades. And her new husband in the 1930s was, uh, was a builder as well. Both of them were laid off and she got involved in, uh, in the unemployed organizations. She was uh, born in 1910. Her name is Ellen Stafford. And she published at 85 years old her memoirs. And she recounts how she was a young mother when more than a thousand of the unemployed men participating in the Aunt Ottawa Trek arrived in Calgary. Here's what she wrote. In Calgary, as at every stop, they paraded. Streets were lined with spectators. We cheered ourselves hoarse. In arenas, in churches, in parks, volunteers prepared and served meals to welcome them. They were our boys. I was in the mayor's office, part of a delegation demanding the trekkers be given a place to stay. I see myself, a place to stay. I see myself now, the skinny young woman I was then, pounding an insignificant fest on the mayor's desk. There are a thousand men out there, Mr. Mayor. They need a place to sleep. What are you going to do about it? Well, they got a place to sleep, sleep, the Calgary Fairgrounds, which I think is the Stampede Park is what she's referring to, and food for the time they'd spend in Calgary. As they boarded the freights en route to their next stop, cheering supporters saw them off and wished them luck. Good wishes weren't all they took with them. They were also presented with 2,400 sandwiches and a side of beef to keep them fed until their next port of call. So that's our depression story. <laughs> I don't, somewhat uplifting, considering, uh, yeah. right? So that's right, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna like fast forward uh, quite a few decades to the um, 80s and 90s. Now uh, we did include quite a few states that do cover the middle of the 20th century, but we did find that there there's just more excitement on kind of the beginning and end of the 20th century and, and the start of the 21st. I, I don't know if this kind of corresponds to like the what what's generally called the like post-war consensus where a lot of people, certainly not everyone, but a lot of people in North America uh, had, you know, a better quality of life, uh, standards of living than in previous decades, like what what we were talking about in the depression and um, as, as kind of austerity kicked in in the, in the seventies and eighties. So it's not to say there, nothing was happening. There were still strikes and things of interest, but uh, for this pre presentation, we did want to note that uh, we kind of fast forward through those decades into kind of more recent things that would be uh, with, I, I think, pretty much everyone watching here within our lifetimes. So um, yeah, so we wanted to cover that. Um, so one that folks might remember if they were in Calgary, uh, this was actually last year was the 20th anniversary of this, um, is the Calgary Herald strike. So it's one of the best known and most impactful strikes in its industry. Um, it started in, and, and ended in 1999. 
Um, so interestingly, Calgary's first trade union um, was uh, the printers in the Calgary Herald in 1887, uh, but the reporters in the newsroom, um, they didn't have a union until they were organized in 1998 uh, to join the Communications Energy and Paper Workers Union of Canada. So, um, so this is what we have on our map. Um, the, the newsroom staff were driven to unionize in response to declining journalistic standards of the paper. Journalists face a management team determined to avoid a collective agreement. Herald employees began a strike in November 1999, and the paper's corporate owner, Conrad Black, pro promised the strike would end in a union decertification. Uh, so again, many people probably know Conrad Black. He's a kind of a a classic uh, figure in Canadian life and journalism, but he, he absolutely didn't want this strike to, con uh, to proceed. He didn't want the union to exist anymore. Um, so they, uh, they were into for quite a fight. So um, fortunately, many Calgarians did show support for the journalists and the union. Um, they had 25% uh, of subscriptions were canceled and advertisers boycotted the Herald. Uh, the city council voted to urge the company to settle the dispute. Local church leaders spoke out uh, to support the strikers. Um, you can see in our slide here, uh, there's a little sticker here, and that would be something that the um, subscribers and Calgarians would put on their mailbox to say that they don't support the paper and that they canceled their subscription. So that's based on um, an actual sticker that was uh, was used and seen. So, yeah. Um, so fortunately, or unfortunately, the uh, after seven months, Black and Herald managed to uh, succeed in decertifying the union when the majority of strikers voted to take a severance package and very few returned to work at the Herald. So the folks who work at the Calgary Herald right now, uh, by and large, not the same folks who worked there um, 20, 30 years ago, just completely different crew. So that definitely had a, an impact on the city and the news coverage of uh, this kind of a turning point. Um, but we didn't want to um, leave folks with uh, kind of <laughs> a, a sad story. So we have a quote from Terry Inigo Jones, who was a striker and a reporter, um, says, you, do, you don't really lose when you stand up and fight for the things you believe in. And we did that. I would say um, one thing that working on this map project uh, did teach me was that there are no really quiet uh, periods in, in Calgary's labor history. Um, we've, we've, we've ended up having to choose the major events. Like in the, in the post-war period, some of the things that surprised me that I, uh, I was reading about were strikes of uh, alcohol servers. So basically uh, bar and, uh, and hotel bar staff so they had a union uh, after the Second World War and they were on strike. And then there was also a big strike of, of hotel workers right around the same thing. So workers that now are not organized and it's, you know, I don't know that there are any bars in Calgary that where the, the wait staff is, is organized, but at one time they were. And in the sixties, I mean, one of the biggest strikes in Calgary's history was a, uh, was a carpenter's or construction strike in, in 1968, when, when a lot of the big buildings were going up and, uh, and thousands, uh, thousands of worker days uh, were involved in that construction strike. But we thought uh, for today's presentation, one of the most relevant and, uh, and relatively recent things we could talk about on the strike were, or on, that are on the map are strikes in the healthcare sector. So given on what's going on in terms of the negotiation between uh, the province and, and Alberta's nurses, um, we may need to update our, our map for the present day. But a nurse's strike would not be unprecedented in Calgary. Calgary nurses were uh, involved in a province-wide strike in January 1988 um, that uh, was illegal. The government had removed nurses' right to strike in 1982, after there had been another nurses' strike in 1980 that resulted in an, a 37.5% wage increase over two years. Uh, and so and then in 1988, this strike was illegal and the Labor Relations Board ordered a cease and desist 
uh, order on the strike's first day. Uh, the, the nurses' union was held in criminal contempt of court, and overall 75 individual uh, charges against nurses would be heard, and the union paid more than $400,000 in fines. But after that um, repression, legal repression, the nurses did gain, uh, made important gains in their next uh, contract. And, and another illegal strike happened in Calgary in, in 1995. Uh, and this one almost triggered a, a province-wide general strike. Uh, 120 workers, and you can see um, them in the bottom. Uh, this is on the right-hand side of the, the screen. Uh, 120 workers in the laundries of Calgary hospitals began their illegal strike, a wildcat strike. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, that's basically a, a, a strike that hasn't been sanctioned by the union leadership and that hasn't gone through the, the regular process. On November 14th, 1995, these uh, workers, mostly women, mainly recent immigrants, had accepted a 28% cut in wages over a two year period, which pushed many below the poverty line. But even after making these concessions, they were brought in, uh, I think to the cafeteria and told that they were given, being given two weeks notice and that laundry services would be contracted out to a private Edmonton company. Rather than continuing to work for the two weeks, they walked out uh, in a spontaneous strike. And days later, more than 2,700 support workers at the city's hospitals had walked out in sympathy. 3,000 workers in Edmonton were preparing to illegally strike, and there was talk of a province-wide walkout. One weekend, the Klein government restored $53 million cut, uh, from a cut of $123 million to the healthcare system. The union and the government reached a deal which guaranteed the laundry workers an additional year of work and a year's severance, and no penalties against the union for the illegal uh, strike. Now, the settlement of that strike remains controversial in terms of uh, within Calgary labor circles about whether uh, the union leadership took the right direction by, uh, by settling. But certainly what participants in this strike, and we, we represented them or we locate them on the map on Memorial Drive, which was where they had a, a picket set up and participants recalled just how many of the cars passing by would honk their horns uh, in support. And, uh, and longtime labor organizers and activists say that this, um, the particular kind of pettiness of going after these workers who had already given up so much uh, seemed to resonate with Calgarians. So this was one of the healthcare uh, strikes that we decided to include. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're actually on our last site, and uh, we, we are going to circle back to the 19th century in a moment here, but uh, kind of overall, we wanted to address, um, I mentioned that uh, we had lots of women to include, um, including most of the, the folks that uh, Kirk was just mentioning, the laundry workers and the nurses. Um, so that was definitely women led and organized and uh, also um, many laundry workers and nurses were people of color. So that uh, was notable as well. Um, and yeah, so we found that um, many of our notable figures were conscientious and forward looking in their views. Um, so for, I mentioned the indigenous fur trade worker site and what we have there is a, a short quote from William Irvine. He's talking about the Hudson's Bay Company in 1920, saying, why celebrate the anniversary of a company that brought the people of Canada into a long regime of exploitation? A day of mourning would be more fitting. And again, kind of uh, some of the readings, events and uh, unearthing of history that we see uh, within Indigenous communities. Uh, I mean, I don't think Irving would have, or Irvine would have like, a problem saying that again it, it's unfortunately like um a hundred years later still a, a problem it's not something to celebrate it's something to like kind of reconcile and mourn so um but yeah um so nonetheless uh working people activists and labor leaders are other people who exist in our society and in their time and place and they can demonstrate uh racist sexist and otherwise bigoted views uh so we did want to not just um pretend that everyone was always included or that 
um, labor was always 100% um, forward looking and correct on the right side of history. Like we do want to acknowledge that uh, there's oversights and things that could be improved and updated. So this is particularly noteworthy in the Chinatown laundries. So that's a, a site that we have. And um, there was a series of incidents in 1892. Uh, so this is how we describe it on June 29th, a laundry worker um, for the Carolry Herald referred to um, having uh, discovered smallpox and he and those who lived um, and worked in, in these areas in Chinatown were placed in quarantine outside of the city and um, the buildings and the contents of them were burned by um, other Calgarians. Um, so the, the local residents, um, as the Herald described it, uh, were bearers of disease and vice, which is again, difficult to read and say, but that's, that's how they thought of them. And um, when, the, when the Chinese folks returned to their homes and workplaces, uh, they were met by a mob of 200. Uh, there was a riot, the Chinese owned businesses were vandalized and the residents were assaulted. So again, that's, that's difficult enough to hear, but uh, the worst part is that uh, Calgary unions backed the boycott of Chinese laundries in 1905, and they said that no, no one deserves these as neighbors, as the Calgary Trades and Labor Council uh, had told the paper. So again, that's not, <laughs> not easy to hear and read, but uh, we, we did want to include that. That is part of uh, the history as well. There is discrimination, um, but I did again want to note that uh, there's many instances where uh, in the map where uh, unions and activists and uh, local communities do support um, different kinds of workers, including uh, BI, POC workers, and uh, we note those as well. So it's kind of a full range of experiences. So I guess uh, in conclusion, um, we could just read the back cover of the map and then we'll turn it over to questions. Um, so what we wrote on the back cover, and I think, I mean, it's, it's definitely true. We could, have, we could have made a much larger map, but it wouldn't have fit on a single piece of paper. Calgary's labor history is extensive, diverse, and very much alive. In spite of its current branding as a city of rugged individualists, Calgary was built literally and metaphorically by workers who organized to promote the common good and community well-being. Along its central streets and peripheries, Calgary has a rich history of solidarity and struggle among working people. This map invites you to trace Calgary's labor history in person. Some of the sites described still stand while others must be imagined as they were, an exercise in seeing the familiar anew. The legacy of this history is not in statues or monuments, but in the values Calgarians have been committed to for generations. When you demand public access to quality education, to health care, to housing, to fair treatment by employers, and to equitable distribution of wealth, um, you are continuing Calgary traditions as old as the city itself and vital to its development and success. So thank you for attending and we'll, uh, I see that there's a couple of questions in the chat and we can, we can start to take those. Uh, so our first question that we have, I believe this may have already been answered, but who commissioned this work? The Calgary Institute for the Humanities is the, um, the group that, that is spearheading the, uh, the Calgary Atlas project. Perfect. So our next question is curious, no images from Riverside, which was a dominant immigrant neighborhood that would have source working class labor. Well, you know, that's true. Uh, and that's, there's, there's so many things that we could have uh, included. I mean, we've got, and, and depending on which, the problem with our map, if you made a map of Calgary today, Mm -hmm. You might pick different sites. If you picked, made a map of Calgary in 1965 or 1945 or 1935, the sites change. The places where workers live shift. Um, you know, like Ogden shops and Ogden was a ma major, largest employer in the city for a long time. So thinking about working class neighborhoods was, was something we definitely considered. Um, but ultimately... Uh, what would you say, Karen? I mean, it just, it didn't make the cut. It was hard to think about how to represent it graphically. Yeah, we actually mm -hmm. did 
quite extensively consider kind of mapping the the neighborhoods of Calgary and where working class people would have lived. Um, just but it just became a little bit complicated with the the timeline because, as Kirk said, I uh, you, you wouldn't say like uh, Hillhurst or Sunnyside right now is exactly a working class area but in the 1930s they were and then you would also have to cover we mostly focus on the inner city just because uh, that's where um, a, a lot of like public spaces are and a lot of the early 20th century history uh, incidents are but as the city expands of course we'd have like more working people further out um, so that's it just became a little bit logistically complex. And so we chose to focus on specific sites and events and figures and locate those uh, geographically rather than kind of covering entire areas of the city or entire neighborhoods and say, this mm-hmm. is working class. But it definitely like uh, we invite people to to bring up and explore and note uh, where the working class uh lived and continues to live and worked and kind of like like set Kirk said in the description kind of see it as uh, from a new perspective which is the entire uh, focus on of the uh, Calgary Atlas project is bringing new perspectives to our space in our city. Definitely and I'm sure when you're making your map you're thinking that people are going to be um, like using it and consuming it and it needs to be not too much that it's overwhelming to be able to um, use it. So that's fabulous. Um, Marie has um, a comment and a question. So love the media you're using um, to present this history. Are you finding that more history is now being shown in many more different ways than in the past? I think yes. I mean, (laughs) I I think... um, Karen's been involved in uh, in making some posters for the Graphic History uh, Collective, um, and, and and graphic novels are diff- dealing with historical subjects in in sometimes quite sophisticated ways. Um, and, and you know, for a long time, there's been telev- television and film trying to deal with historical subjects. So. Uh, I mean, I, I guess more than in the past, I think, you know, I, I, I do think that um, for a mainly academic historian like myself, finding ways to, um, to produce things that people might actually read or enjoy uh, is, is probably not a bad idea. So this, this has been a real opportunity for me and Karen's artist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, it. for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I do want to mention um, the the possibility of audio and video as well. I think we mentioned at the the very beginning that um, I'm involved with uh, podcasts and there's also YouTube video series. Um, I know a local one is uh, Sweater Weather. So that has um, kind of uh, arts and culture from a progressive perspective as well. Uh, So those are just things that wouldn't have been possible kind of pre-internet and uh, more more accessible internet for most people that you can choose to spend, you know, half an hour, a couple of hours, uh, not just looking at something and reading something, but also like uh, listening and viewing. Uh, there's, there's definitely much more than there was when I was growing up. And um, even like spaces that were kind of uh, a little questionable in the past, like for, for heritage minutes, even there's just kind of more, uh, better heritage minutes they're more inclusive they're more uh, <clears throat> emotional versus like kind of the goofy ones we remembered that have a lot of a lot of issues in terms mm-hmm. of how they're presenting history so yeah so I think it's much better so we obviously want to work and continue to produce work that contributes to the conversation but there's there's a lot out there so yes definitely um I just kind of thinking of what I have seen and it definitely seems that artists and um creators are kind of really keeping um, history alive in new interesting ways. I'm kind of thinking of how there's some Indigenous artists that are taking like Hudson Bay blankets and doing um, the smallpox art with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, you know, 
social media. There's so many different content creators creating those short videos about different historical things in their cities. Um, so I would really like if we could go back and talk about the Battle of Mission Hill. That very much caught my interest <laughs> during the um, presentation. And my question about it is, is that what they referred to it at the time or is that what we're calling it now? No, that, that was the, the participants name for it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't think the Herald called it that. I think they just called it a riot. Um, but the, the uh, Pat Lanahan who was involved, I mean, he, he refers to it as the battle of mission Hill and, um, and in the, uh, the RCMP uh, security, you can read their files. Mm -hmm. And so they, they've got some transcripts of speeches um, calling it the battle of mission Hill, but yes, it's interesting. And the, and the coverage in the Herald is, is quite fascinating because this was quite a dramatic event. Mm -hmm. as you, you could probably tell, but they, they, it wasn't the only one um, in terms of numbers, some of the pictures in the Glenbo archives of the size of these demonstrations you know, thousands of people marching down uh, McLeod Trail uh, and, and, and some really creative protests too. Um, one that, uh, that I, I tell my students about sometimes that the Calgary Unemployed did was a Buy Nothing protest. So some of you might remember Buy Nothing days where you'd, you know, you'd be encouraged not to buy to, to avoid consumerism. But in the, in the 30s, it had a different context. So they had several hundred unemployed uh, family, men, women, and children, and they marched through the Hudson's Bay store. So they went into the Hudson's Bay store and the organizer gave them this big speech at the beginning, like, you know, you'll see a lot of nice stuff in there, some stuff that you may, might really like, but do not steal it because that will <laughs> be the only thing that will come out of this demonstration. And do not be polite to the staff because they're working people like you and their job, they're probably going to lose their job because you can't buy the stuff that you need. So they just walked through silently. They looked at all the things that they would like, that they could need, but that they couldn't afford. And then they left. Um, and then this got kind of coverage and was trying to point out, like, we have the goods in the store. We have the people whose lives depend on selling them, the people who are employed in the store, uh, and we have the demand, and yet our economy has collapsed to such a state that it isn't working. So I thought that was kind of a creative one. So we could have put the Hudson's Bay store downtown, which is where they did it uh, on our map, but we didn't. Um, and I think there was a, a question in the, if, sorry, not to step on your toes, Catherine, but oh, whether this right. map is useful to working people. So I think that um, this Calgary Atlas is really cool and, and it's going to be neat to look at in their artistic projects and it, it captures a little bit of the history, but I think it would be good to have a more usable map and the Calgary District Labor Council, along with, with ALHI, the Alberta Labor History Institute, produced a labor history map of Calgary with a bit, bit more scope about uh, I'm going to say about 12 years ago, 2009. Um, some sites of our map, we, uh, we overlap. They did a wonderful job on it. They, they paid attention to things, actually talking about neighborhoods, they paid attention to things like um, where homeless populations lived. Edworthy Park, for example, during the Depression was a place where there were kind of shanty towns, etc. cetera. Um, so I don't know how useful in terms of a map where people could walk around, but what we're hoping to do with this and maybe in collaboration with Alhi would be to create a website and, and maybe some kind of app where you could go to the site and get some sense of, uh, of the history of the workers who have lived here before uh, and the kind of strategies that they tried sometimes with success, sometimes with failure um, to try and better their, their lives and working conditions. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see this as, you know, that this exists for particularly 
like definition of a project that includes other perspectives as well. And we definitely wanted to include the labor and working class perspective, but the information that we have and updated since, since the original Alhai map was produced, I, I think can definitely go in different directions and be more perhaps practical or useful in terms of people trying to find and explore these places uh, in real life, not just to sit back and and look. But I mean, I, I would argue that um, even as this map exists, it should be uh, understandable to most people. And um, even throughout history of, of working class people, those are the people who formed book clubs, uh, ran printing presses, definitely like capable of understanding and interpreting complex information. So it's not as if you need to kind of like simplify something that like a person who works in a factory can understand it and use it. So I think this is still perfectly adequate for that. But in terms of practical, useful, in terms of anyone finding these sites and doing walking tours, things like that, definitely room to expand and, uh, and put it in different formats uh, to, to be the most helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, our next question kind of builds on um, what you're saying. So Travis says, sounds like there is a ton of historic and current sites and stories. Where does the project go after the map is complete? I would love to see some large drawings and more, say, in a gallery show. Sounds like a space like the Labor Temple would be an amazing place to host. Um, is there anywhere like that today? Um, so I think lots of questions the, in there. The Legion, the Legion still hosts events. So that, that might be a place where we could uh, put up some, some pictures. I mean, it, it seems to me that these, these, this Atlas project is producing some really uh, cool art and, uh, and, and some, some wonderful um, projects that it would be nice to see them all together in dialogue with each other. But I think that's, and uh, that's going to be up to the organizers of the project. Certainly. Certainly. Yeah, the, the um, Indigenous Stampede map, actually, the, uh, the beautiful um, buffalo skin that has the map on it, that if you get the printed version, it's a photograph of this object. But that object was uh, on display in the Glenbow Museum uh, during the spring. So some of the maps lend themselves more to gallery viewing uh, than others. I mean, my my background is more design and commercial art, but I mean, I'm certainly not opposed to putting anything in galleries for people to see. Uh, the only other space that I could think that would be appropriate that is kind of a, a working class labor space is the... Um, Calgary District, District Labor Council, which isn't on our map because it's uh, mostly an administration space, but they do host events and kind of uh, union activities and things. So that that would perhaps be a good uh, public space. It's not central, it's uh, up in the Northeast, but um, I'm, I'm thinking of like spaces that would be similar to the Labor Temple now. So. Mm -hmm. I think that they really love your art, Karen. Well, thank you. I, I do appreciate that. And uh, like I said at the beginning, it, it might be a little bit, tiny bit different when it uh, comes to print because we're just uh, making sure all of the um, the colors, lines, aspects kind of look best for, for print and are most dynamic and kind of colorful. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad that people are connecting with that. I did want to kind of um, represent the subject matter um, as it appears in photos and things, but also kind of bring uh, a little bit different experience than you would get just from looking at, at a photograph or collage, so. Mm -hmm. uh, from how you're saying how there are the other maps as well, um, with this project, do you both see maybe there being a 2.0 version of this map coming out where you might focus on the same topic, but the different locations you weren't able to include? Well, I think if it if it was, um, sorry, I'll, I'll speak for myself first, and then and then Karen could say whether she would do a map 2.0. But I think in in a kind of iteration where if you had a website with a Google Map where you could add different sites and people mm -hmm. could do walking tours, um, then that might lend itself. Whether Karen will want to 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 draw uh, all of those as well, I don't know, because there's a lot more work involved in that than, oh, than writing a hundred sure. words. 
I mean, like Kirk and I have discussed like different uh, ways to feature um, labor history as well that would include art, like uh, kind of things we've mentioned before, like uh, posters, comics, uh, mapping and geography is a really great way to do it. It just seems to kind of instantly involve people in whatever you're doing so that they can see and go and, and make that like a, a real world time-based experience. But um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly open to that, but um, as Kirk said, it's kind of up to to the project folks to uh, see what they want to do after. And we, and we know that there's lots of other um, perspectives and maps uh, kind of coming along the way as well, so. Perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So I'm just gonna give everyone a minute if they have anything else they would like to ask. Uh, but you see, you two seem to work so well together as a team, and you created something very educational and very beautiful and interactive. So I'm sure that you're going to make our group that we have here today, as well as um, other Calgarians that get to experience it, um, very happy. Thanks so much, Catherine. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to um, invite Marie to come back, and she's going to just give us some closing remarks, unless there's anything else you two would like to um, say to our audience. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> we appreciate it a lot. Perfect. Well, thank you again on behalf of the Calgary Library. We really appreciated you both <laughs> being here today. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you, Calgary Public Library. Thank you, audience. Do not forget us, the Chinook history, uh, all of the programs that we put on, what we have on our site. And uh, if you feel strongly that you want to know more, we are a good place to start if you want to buy a membership. Thank you.